I recently asked, how did I produce those images for Urban Acorn? How do they make them look so vibrant? Well, I'm going to show you the process I use to create these images, and it's actually very, very simple. Now, I'm sure if many of you have heard of multi-shot multi bracketing or, or doing different exposures for different areas of your scene in order to get uh, different results. Like, for instance, you can see here, I took this shot to expose for the outer area and these lights and I moved up in exposure to, to highlight more and more areas until I got all the areas in the exposure. Now I'm sure many of you have seen HDR images that have that fake look to it, the unnatural look. Now what we're trying to do is produce an image that is very very natural looking yet still have a nice style to it. So first off what we're going to do is take our five exposures Right, and find the exposure that we find to be the most um, normal exposed. As you can see, this one's a little bit overexposed for the back, and this one's a little bit underexposed for the area. Now, usually, what a lot of people do is they take this photo, the normal exposure one, and they start twinker, tinkering with it. So, if I was to start twink, tinkering with this image and lowering the highlights, you can see I can get a lot of outer detail as well as these light areas here. Aren't, aren't as bright but you can see in the background here these areas are completely blown out and you can see if I was to do a white area it's not as blown as, as I thought but it's pretty blown out you can't really see a lot of detail as you would in this here you can see a lot of detail you can see the 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 actual bulbs themselves the fluorescence of it so I'm gonna set this back to highlights now the first thing you want to do is you want to do your white balance, right? Just to make sure that, because with a raw file it has so much more information and to do this later on would be more of a nightmare, you won't get of a natural look. So I don't actually want it to be perfect white balance, I just kind of like the yellow glow of it. Just because it gives it a nice um, warm feeling, a nice inviting feeling, a place I actually want to go and sit down and, and eat. So I'm kind of just going to have a little bit of yellow in it. Let's do a little bit of white balance in here. Just look at, it's creating a little bit more yellow in it. And I kind of like that. I actually like this blue tone you can see in the in the window area here. So I kind of like that. So once I've gotten the white balance that I, I like, that feels good to me, I move over into my sharpening tool. Now I'm just going to sharpen this up a little bit, which is about half, a little bit more than half, which is about 90. Let's get a little more detail the bricks and these lines. Next I move over to noise reduction. This shouldn't be too much noise in this image since I shot at ISO 100 uh, at F10 so it's a pretty relatively sharp image. You shouldn't see any problems with uh, noise or anything of, like that but just in case just put a little bit of noise reduction in there make it uh, look a little better. Now the next step is enable profile corrections. Now you always want to do this with your camera because with a 17 millimeter lens you're going to have with a 17 millimeter lens like this you're going to have a lot of uh, distortion which is just a wide angle lens. So by enabling profile corrections it's going to use the software just to fix it and a little bit, make it look flatter and more uh, as if it was really shot rather than that distortion barrel distortion you get with a lot of images. So just by clicking that you can see the huge difference it creates. Obviously you get a little cut off on the side, but obviously that's going to happen since you're adjusting the image. Now, removing chromatic aberrations you should also do just to make sure there's no aberrations in the uh, brighter areas. There's not really much in this one that I saw recently, so it was pretty, pretty dead on. This is a really good lens I'm using. Now, I usually do auto, um, auto level, but this image is pretty level as I, as I used a level just to make sure this is 100% uh, straight as well as to create the because you're doing interior interior images so you always want to make sure all your lines are straight if you're going up or down once you see something lower once you see something higher don't rotate your lens don't rotate your camera make sure you're just going straight up or straight down that way it creates a nice uh, straight lines whenever you're doing these photos especially with a light old wider lens that will create even more of a distortion so like I said, these lines are nice and straight. I noticed that before, so I'm just going to leave it 
off of auto. And pretty much that's all you really want to change for all these shots right out of the camera. You don't want to do too much because it's not necessary. So what you do next, you take this image and you click on all your other images into here. Now what we're going to do is we're going to sync those settings so each image is exactly the same. So we're not getting any ghosting effects when we move to Photoshop. So it's going to synchronize all. Bam. Now all these images are exactly the same. Now I know a lot of you are probably wondering why am I using a one by one uh, aspect. Well, I wanted them to have an image they could use for Pinterest or or Facebook. That's an image you can see right away and you get everything you need to do, everything about the place in one easy shot. So this the this is the reason why I'm using the 1.1. As you can see, there's a nice follow line here as it leads you directly into the into the image, as well as leads you right to the urban acorn somewhere here, which then brings you straight into the uh, the scene. So I really like the composition in this shot as well. So it really works out with the one by one for Facebook and Pinterest and online use, as well as a really good composition just to bring it in there. So I really love using this image. So like I said, now that we have it all synced, we're going to export our images into Photoshop. Now we save our images and save your images wherever you like. It's not, not much of a big deal there. And make sure you save it in TIFF and no compression, uh, Pro Photo RGB with a depth component of 16 bits. You don't want to do 8 bits because 8 bits will create more of a banding effect with your photos. You won't get a nice smooth gradient from the darker areas to so underexposed to the overexposed areas it won't look as, as good so save your photos and export them to Photoshop alright now we're back in Photoshop now what we're going to do is go to file automate merge HD Pro now browse the files that were used which would be one select all your files Photoshop will organize the files for you so you don't have to worry about anything like that. Select your files and put them like this. Now press OK. Basically what we're going to do is create a dynamic, high dynamic range image. Basically a HDR image. A lot of people are, are, I know a lot about HDR and they see HDR images and they look really terrible and they say, oh I don't want my image to look at that. What we're trying to do is more it can look more natural. So a lot of people use photo matrix to make their photos look like look more HDR and I don't like the look of it. I find that Photoshop does a better, a way better um, dynamic range or tone map than other photos, than other programs. So let it do its thing. So basically what we're going to have is an image that's so detailed, so much information that you can just have so much more information to deal with, more play in your images. So it's going to open up a dialog box here. As you can see, you can work at 32-bit, 8-bit, or 16-bit. I'll show you what 8-bit looks like. When you shoot at 8-bit, this is basically what you're going to see. A lot of times you see HDR images that looks kind of like this. This doesn't look, looks more fake because it's kind of processing all the information for you. And yet you're losing a lot of detail in here. So even if I was to do the highlight lowering, it still looks fake. It doesn't look as natural. It does a fake look to it. They have a couple of settings here you can use to the twilight photo contrast all these looks that just does not work for a natural look this just looks terrible so what we're going to do is gonna move over and go to 32 bit and let Lightroom do the processing for us so you can pick any of these ones to use as your normal no you can't basically just ex change the exposure down you can see you have all this information you now have in one image the lowest exposure point to the highest exposure point. So when we move over into Lightroom, you can play around with all these settings. So just press OK. Now make sure, as you can see it's a 32-bit image, so make sure when you're saving, save to TIFF. Make 
make sure you save to 32-bit. I usually don't do compression as I don't really care too much. I have a lot of space on my computer. And press OK. Now we're going to move it back over to Lightroom. As you can see, is a TIFF file, but there's so much more information, as I'll show you in a second, to deal with. So if I was going to exposure points, you have so much more information. It's practically like turning the lights on. There's so much information you can see in the image you wouldn't necessarily get to see. As you can see here, all that image detail I had here, it's still there. And it pretty much is like it's turning on the lights. Just a nice smooth gradient from light to dark. Now, as you can see, this is not what I want as my final image. So this is where we start doing our changes to make it look to the final image. So usually what I do first is I go to my blacks, hold alt. I don't want to have it too black. Let's get a little bit of the darker areas here. It's for my whites. Make sure I go down so I don't see anything. I don't want too many white areas in my image. I bump up my exposure to where I feel I like it. And then I lower my highlights. By lowering your highlights, you're going to start start seeing the details in the window area. Just lower those highlights and bam, the details start to show up. Now, what I usually do is open up the shadows a little bit so you can start seeing details in the shadowy areas. Maybe let's bump this up exposure a little bit here. And add a little bit more contrast to it. As you can see, it starts to come alive. And look, have a nice gradient from outside to inside while still having that natural look. Now once I've done that, as I told you before, I like the blue, the way it moves from outside into a nice gradient here. But you can see here, all the detail is still in the shot in the highlight area. You can start seeing a lot of the detail, which you wouldn't be able to get with the original shot. All the crazy beautiful detail. As well. As you can see there's a lot of things I need to fix in Photoshop here as well as the floor. Not the best looking right now. But my highlights are perfect. I love it. Well, the dark areas and the light areas. I may blow this up a little slightly. I kind of like it the way it is. You can see a nice dynamic range from high light to dark. And next thing I do is, as you can see, you don't need to. It's going to come back. We don't need to do anything. Things again. You could do auto now, but shouldn't do much anything should be perfectly fine there as we said before that's kind of it what now I'm gonna what I'm gonna do now is gonna make it look more dynamic it's it looked great but still missing a dynamic feel to it so what I do to make images more dynamic is I use the radio filter or you can also use the adjustment brush but I can just use the radio filter since I'm dealing with lights Basically what you do, take your radial filter, pop a nice circle here, invert it so it's not affecting the outside but affecting the inside area, and just up your exposure slightly. Makes the lights look like they're on, that looks more dynamic. Let's do that for a couple other ones. You don't have to do it for all of them, but I usually do it for the ones that are more are they near to the camera? Just give it a little bit more dynamic feel to it. Change your radius to where you want it to be. Just make it a little bit bigger. A little bit bigger here. And I'll probably put one more for this one. We'll do a bit quick and dirty look to it. But one more, let's say around here, and up that exposure. Creates a little bit more dynamic look to it. It doesn't feel as static. Done. 
And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to put a little uh, post processing vignetting. So that way, this brings your eye more into the image, feeling like you're being drawn in. So it's a little bit in the center, creating a nice dynamic look to your image. Now, I'll show you the before and after so you can get a, an idea of what it looked like. So you'll see it's way more information, it's way more dynamic looking image as the previous one. I'll show you a little later what the original looked like as compared to this one. So there, we're done. So now we're just going to move that back over to Photoshop. All right, now we're back in Photoshop once again for final processing of the image. Now, there's certain things I don't like about this image that needs to be changed to make it a little more uh, cleaner. As you can see, the, the floor, as I said before, is very, very um, blotchy with paint, as well as there's some areas here, some areas in this here that I like to get rid of, as well as this area here. That's pretty much what I want to get rid of. There's some areas over here that I don't like as well. As you can see, there's some stuff in the corner here, but there's easy ways of doing it without affecting too much of your time. We don't have to waste too much time editing it. Something I also don't like is the right here. I'm not a big fan of the uh, electrical box. I find it's just you can see it too much. There's two ways of doing it. You can either get rid of the box itself to make it look the best, or I'm sure it's part of the look of the place. So you don't want to get rid of it altogether. But what we're going to do is we're going to find a really simple way to make it look less um, visible. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to select the area with the lasso tool here and just select the corners. And the quick and dirty version of it. So just going to select that real quick. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the brightness and contrast. Now what we're going to do, we're just going to make it a little bit less visible and more blending into the, the background. As the background is very, very white, it's very easy to make it blend into that same color. So we're going to do a simple technique here where I'm just going to brighten it up slightly lower the contrast just so it kind of blends into the background. As you can see it's now it's a little bit less noticeable. Still there, but it's a little bit less noticeable and creates a more harmonious image. It doesn't seem like it's out of place. Now once I've done that, I look for all these blotchy areas. As you can see there's many blotchy areas here. I do not like at all. It's very, very annoying to look at. So let's clean it up real quick. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to the clone tool. Or sorry, I mean the healing brush tool. And we're just going to do a very simple spot healing. Basically what it's going to do is going to interpolate the area, the size of the areas around it and merge it together to make it look like it's not there. So basically all you do is this bam, disappears automatically. I'm just going to do a quick and dirty version of it. Usually you spend a lot of time making the area look completely clean, but obviously I've done this with the original, so I'm not going to spend too much time with it. I love this tool. It's really good for getting rid of wrinkles on faces very very simply without having to waste all your time using a clone stamp. Sometimes when you use the clone stamp tool it creates a blotchiness or a softness to the image that I don't necessarily like. It's, it's good in certain scenarios but once Photoshop created this technology here it just made everything way easier. I'm not going to do this area right away as if it's a little bit more difficult. Let's see if I can do it real quick without creating too much of a problem. Sometimes it will interpret it correctly, but it seems to be working oh, relatively good. 
Sometimes for those tough areas, you need to use the other healing brush, which is, well, the healing brush, to get rid of those areas a little bit cleaner. But like I said, I'm just doing a quick and dirty version of it. Just to do a little bit of work here. Were the major areas. We didn't have time as the place is still a little bit fresh. We didn't have time to redo the floors yet, so well, I'll have to redo the floors for them. It's not perfect. As I can say, I guess I could spend a lot of time, which the original one I spent a lot of time just fixing up the floor. more maybe a little bit here too i think it's more of a reflection but i don't like it oh my bad i keep thinking it's the healing brush but it is not and here this may, may be a little bit tricky since sometimes if you have an area that's very contrasted to the other areas it may it'll interpret a little bit wrong as you can see there it's not doing it correctly for scenarios like this i create a new layer in this scenario, I'll probably end up using clone stamp. Here's a great example of one you can use clone stamp and use it correctly. Because I will clone stamp this area. Oh, wrong one. And I will clone stamp it. Like that. Let's do a little opacity switch. And then I will just erase the sides of it. So it fits perfectly. In the image, open it up, and it's pretty much perfect. Not 100%, but like I said, I'm not going to do 100% image here. And I just merge it back together. Bam. As you can see, this original version, the floor is way cleaner than it was before. Now I'll move over to other areas. I'll, I think I will need a little bit of cleaning, like this area here. I need a little bit of Cleaning. In this case, I'm going to use the uh, healing brush. Since it's not straight lines, it's more of an area. All right, healing brush, and let's click this area. I tend to use my mouse when it comes to the healing brush rather than the uh, Wacom tablet, as I just find it way easier to use. Some things the Wacom tablet's great for, certain things I just find way easier to do. With the mouse. So the Wacom tablet, I have to take off certain settings that I don't necessarily want to take off and fiddle with too much. Which is the pen pressure. So let's do a little, oh, that's not good at all. In this case, I'll, I'll probably use the Spot healing. Spot, spot, spot. Not going to be on there, but I'm just going to do a quick and dirty version. I'm not going to spend too much time. If you want to get that perfectly, you probably just make your brush a little bit smaller to get a little deeper area. It's not great, but affections out my tool. My I'm trying to show right now. Now that's most of them. I just was to show you the original. Looks way better without it. Now I know some other areas up here. Just go through your image. Look for any anything that you find completely noticeable. This is going to not make the image look good. And just fix them up. Go back to my healing brush. Alt tab. Bam. Real quick. Doesn't have to be perfect. I was getting the clone area here. Oh, there you go. There's some areas over here I noticed. I think I noticed this over on the original version, but I notice it now, so I'm just gonna use my OCD and go through a little bit. That's pretty much the way I like to use the photo to make the photo look good. There's one other area, actually two other areas I was talking about earlier that I would like to change. 
as you can see here it's a very contrast area it's very yellow I can notice it right away from when it's zoomed out so I'm gonna do pretty much the same similar to the technique I used before to brighten this up but what we're gonna do is we're gonna desaturate that small area so I'm just gonna do a small garbage mask here like that click on hue saturation and obviously it's a yellow color so it's going to drop that yellow down until it's practically not even noticeable from there we're just going to do a little more cleaner mask so you don't notice it transition and as much oh, wrong fix that and it is practically gone. Not perfect, but it's obviously not as noticeable as it was before. You don't really, it doesn't really stick out in your eye. You can clearly move through the images without noticing it uh, too much. Obviously, if you want to be really, really anal, you can clean up this entire area by just taking certain areas here cloning it, bringing it down to make it look perfect, but it wasn't too necessary in this shot, so I didn't do it. It all depends on how, how anal you want to be in your photography. I usually am pretty anal, but like I said, I didn't really think it was necessary for this photo. And it looks pretty good. And that's pretty much the whole process I go through here. There's some other areas here that you pretty much do this clone stamping area to get rid of. Do the same thing you did with the floors in order to get that perfect as well that's kind of it i don't think there's anything else i remember i need to do a quick comparison with the original photo and this version so this is the original version here it's a similar normal exposure version versus the now processed version in hdr 32 bit so whenever you're doing hdr images uh, I'll try to make them look more natural rather than that fake, globally artistic look, uh, which doesn't really work for interior design. You want to make it nice and and more realistic, basically, as we try and produce. So yeah, so you can see the highlights are not as blown out here. The lights here, as you can see, are very blown out in this area. And in this area, you can see all the detail in the image. Not have to worry about anything so there you go that's pretty much the process from yay from nay to yay so if you'd like to see more of these videos please like and subscribe and I'll make some as quick as I possibly can for some of my other projects until next time I'm Justin Eastman